Hello and welcome to another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 9, Lesson 4, on intersecting chords. So we've been spending quite a bit of time looking at inscribed angles and circles. Today we move on from that and we start to look at things that occur when two chords intersect each other within a circle. So let's jump right into it. All right, intersecting chords. Two chords that intersect inside of a circle have interesting properties, both in the angles that they make and their partitioned lengths. We will look at each of these relationships in this lesson. First, we state, without proof, a theorem regarding the angles made by intersecting chords. Let's take a look at that theorem. The measure of the angle created by two intersecting chords is equal to one half of the sum of the two arcs intercepted by the angle. All right, so in other words, right, when we have two chords that intersect, like we do here, okay, um, when we pick one of the given angles, what will happen is it will intersect two arcs. My claim, and we'll prove this after this particular exercise, is that the measure of that angle will be one half the sum of the two arcs that are intercepted. Let's play around with that a little bit in exercise number one. In circle O, chords AB and CD intersect at point E. What angle is congruent to AED and Y? All right, well, this should be simple enough. Locate angle AED on the picture, and there's another angle in the picture that is congruent to it. State what angle that is and why they're congruent. Pause the video now. Well, let's first locate angle AEB. Right, it's right here, or sorry, AED, it's right there. And that's gonna be congruent to angle CEB because they're vertical angles. Right, they are a vertical angle pair. All right, simple enough. Now letter B. What two arcs are intercepted by angle AED and the angle from A highlight them on the diagram. All right, so what two arcs are intercepted by this angle and this angle? Pause the video and kind of highlight them on the diagram. It's really great if you actually have highlighters. Pause the video now. All right, well, it's gonna be arc AD. That's what AED is gonna intercept. And arc BC or CB, that's what angle BEC will intercept. So we're going to have uh, AD and CD. And that's important. And there we have them highlighted. Hopefully you can see them. Whoop, CB. Get a CB, not CD, CB. Like a CB radio. All right, CB. And that's important because, of course, the theorem says that the measure of this angle or this angle they're the same, is going to be one half the sum of arc AD and arc BC, all right? So we have to be able to identify the arcs that are intercepted by these angles in order to even apply the theorem, okay? So let's now take a look at letter C. Let me move this out of the way. If the measure of the smaller arc from B is equal to 57 degrees and the measure of the larger arc is equal to 75 degrees, then use the theorem to determine the measure of angle AED. All right, so in other words, if this is 57 degrees and this is 75 degrees, then we wanna figure out the measure of angle AED. And it's, it's really simple, right? So the measure of angle AED whoops, AED, is going to be one half of the measure of arc AD plus the measure of arc, the measure of arc BC. And that's just going to be one half of 57 plus 75. And we can just use our calculators on that. We can say, all right, we got 57 plus 75 that's going to be 132, so we have one half of 132. And so we can just divide that by two. And we're going to get 66 degrees. Okay. Simple, right? 
Now, by the way, you could also phrase this theorem as saying that those two angles, angle AED and BEC, are simply equal to the average of the two arcs that they're intercepted, right? Anytime we add two things and divide by two, or find one half of the sum, we're averaging the two arcs. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Okay, now, right at this point, what we know is that that's 66 degrees and that's 66 degrees. And I always kind of like to, to put anything that I find in on these diagrams. Now let's take a look at letter D. If the measure of arc AC is equal to 60 degrees, then use the theorem to determine the measure of arc BD. Verify that all four arcs sum to 360 degrees. Okay, so in other words, now at this point, right, I know that this is 60 degrees, okay, and I want to somehow use the theorem to figure out the measure of arc BD, okay? Now, how do I use that theorem to figure this out? Well, the way that I can do it is I can say, look, I know that this is 66 degrees. So, because I know that, I can say that the measure of angle AEC is going to be 180 degrees minus 66 degrees, and that is 114 degrees. Okay? Now, what I also know is that 114 degrees should be 60 plus the measure of arc BD divided by 2. So I can now set up an equation that says 114 degrees is 60 degrees plus the measure of BD, all divided by 2. Let me put a little line there. All right. And oftentimes this theorem gets used in this direction. In other words, you know the angle, you know one of the arcs, and you're trying to find the other arc. All right. So I know the 114 degree angle, just because those two angles have to be supplementary. Right. So now I can multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of that one half or that factor of two, right? That's gonna give me 228 degrees is equal to 60 degrees plus the measure of arc AB, or sorry, the measure of arc BD. Then I can subtract 60 from both of these and that's gonna give me the measure of arc BD is equal to 100 and 88 degrees, is that right? Yeah, 168. Thank you. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. I knew that it was a minor arc, so it shouldn't be larger than 180 degrees. Now, the last thing that it said was just to verify, right, that all four arcs have to add up to 360 degrees. And that's a good thing to like at least verify, right? We knew this was 57 degrees. This was 75 degrees, so if we do 57 plus 60 plus 75 plus 168, let's just make sure that's equal to 360. Clear that out. 57 plus 60 plus 75 plus 168 is 360. Just a little verification. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. If I were just asked to figure out the measure of arc BD and I had these three other arcs, I would just add them together and subtract from 360. I probably wouldn't use this particular theorem. The reason for letter B is to show how that theorem can kind of be used if you know the angle and one of the two arcs, right? So the, the direct application of the theorem is, you know, if I know the two arcs, I add them together, I divide by two, and I get that angle. The indirect application of the theorem is if I know the angle and one of the arcs, how can I find the other arc? And that's obviously it takes a little more work because you have to do some algebra as opposed to just sort of like plugging numbers in and cranking them out. All right. Now, of course, as always in geometry, we don't want to just have a theorem without proving it, right? Maybe the whole point of geometry is to be able to prove things that we've figured out. So, the reasoning behind why this theorem is true falls back on our work with inscribed angles. We will prove this theorem in the next exercise. So let's take a look at exercise number two. In circle M, segment DE and segment FG intersect at point H. 
we want to show that the measure of angle GHE is one half the sum of the measure of arc GE with the arc DF. All right, letter A. Draw in auxiliary line segment DG. All right, that should be simple enough. Why don't you go ahead and draw that in? All right, and this is again a great example of where we cannot prove this theorem without first drawing another line in there. A line that isn't in there originally, but clearly can be drawn. Now let's take a look at letter B. Why can we state that the measure of angle GHE is equal to the measure of angle D plus the measure of angle G? Why can we state that? Pause the video now, look at where each one of those three angles lies, and see if you can explain why this has to be true. Well, let's just make sure, right? Here's GHE. That's the one that we really care about, okay? Here's angle D. Here's angle G, right? And yet again, we have the exterior angle theorem, right? So angle GHE is an exterior angle of triangle DHG with angle D and angle, whoops, angle G, its remote interior angles. Right? And any time we have an exterior angle to a triangle, that exterior angle is always the sum of the two remote interior angles. Let's take a look at angle at letter C. Using what we know about inscribed angles, state an equation for each of the following. The measure of angle D equals and the measure of angle G equals. All right, why don't you go ahead and state what both of those two are equal to in terms of the measures of the arcs that they intercept. Well, the measure of angle D must be one half the measure of arc GE, right? And the measure of angle G must be one half the measure of arc DF. Okay, and that's just based on the fact that an inscribed angle is always one half the measure of the arc that it intercepts. And now we're just about there, right? Letter D. Use the equality in B along with your results from B to prove the desired relationship. Actually, it should say along with your results, I apologize, from letter C to prove the desired relationship. All right, so the equality in B, right, was that the measure of angle GHE was equal to the measure of angle G, well, equal to the measure of angle D, plus the measure of angle G, all right? But each one of these can then be thought of in terms of inscribed angle relationships with arcs. So the measure of angle GHE is one half the measure of arc GE, whoops, GE plus one half the measure of arc DF, and you probably almost see it at this point, we can now factor a one half out of both of these, and we can say that the measure of angle GHE is one half the measure of GE plus the measure of arc DF. Right? And that's it. But think about all of what this combines, right? First thing, right, it combines an auxiliary line right, that we draw in to establish a triangle. Then the angle that we care about, right, that particular angle, that exterior angle, must be equal to the sum of those two remote interior angles. But those two remote interior angles are exactly the angles that intercept the arcs that we care about. That angle being one half GE, that angle being one half DF, 
And so that exterior angle must be the sum of one half of GE plus one half of DF, right? That's right here. Then we can factor the one half out and we can just say that the measure of angle GHE is one half the sum of the measure of GE plus DF. So cool. Combines the exterior angle theorem with facts about right inscribed angles to get a relationship between the angles that intersecting chords make with the arcs that they intercept. Really kind of cool. And only true because of that relationship that we had with inscribed angles. Let's take a look at exercise number three. In circle O shown, chords A, B, and C, D are perpendicular and intersect at point E. If the measure of arc B, D is equal to 126 degrees, then determine the measure of arc A, C. All right. See if you can use that theorem that we just saw to figure out the answer to this particular problem. Well, what I know, right, from that theorem, and remember, I've got the measure of arc BD, all right, that's 126 degrees. I'm looking for the measure of arc AC, that's my question mark, right? And what I know is that the measure of angle DEB will be the measure of arc AC, which is what I'm looking for, plus the measure of arc BD, all divided by two. Okay, that's what that theorem tells me. But because CD and AB are perpendicular to each other, I know this must be a 90 degree angle. I'm looking for the measure of arc AC. I know the measure of arc BD is 126 degrees, right? So now I'm sort of doing that thing where I'm indirectly using the theorem, right? I've got the theorem. I know the angle that the two, that the two chords make when they intersect. I know one of the two arcs that are intercepted by the two chords. I need to figure out the other one. So now I can multiply both sides by two to get rid of the two. That's gonna give me 180 degrees is equal to the measure of arc AC plus 126 degrees. I can now just subtract that 126 degrees from both sides and I'll get the measure of arc AC is 54 degrees. All right, and that's it. It's a pretty easy theorem to use. It's one that you have to commit to memory but it's pretty easy to use whether or not you're taking the two arcs, adding them together and dividing by two, or whether you know what the angle is, you know one of the arcs, then you just have to do a little bit of algebra. Now, there's an additional thing that we wanna look at with intersecting chords, which is the partitioning of those chords. Another important relationship exists between the partitioned segments of the two chords that intersect each other. So let's look at that relationship, and then we'll eventually prove it. Intersecting chords and segment lengths. When two chords intersect inside of a circle, the product, product of the partitioned lengths of one chord is equal to the product of the partitioned lengths of the other chord. Now this is very important, right? If I've got these two chords, A, B, and C, D intersecting in a circle at point E, then what this theorem says is if I take A, E, and I multiply it by B, E, I'll get exactly the same thing as if I take C, E, and multiply it by DE. Please note, this is a product issue and not a sum issue. If it was a sum issue, that would be very weird, right? If it was a sum, if like AE plus BE was equal to CE plus DE, that would say that all chords drawn inside of a circle were the same length, which they clearly don't have to be. Some chords are longer than others, right? It's just the product. AE times BE is equal to CE times DE. Now this is an exceptionally easy theorem to use, so we're gonna go ahead and use it, and then in the next exercise, you know what we're doing, we're gonna prove it. But let's first use the theorem. Exercise number three. In the diagram of circle O, chords A, B, and C, D intersect at E such that A, E is six, B, E is four, and D, E is three. Use the above theorem to find the length of C, E. All right, so it, it's actually kind of hard to make problems that use this theorem difficult, literally, because I've got AE is six, BE is four, all right, I've got DE is three, 
and I want to figure out what CE is equal to. And this theorem just says, look, if I take DE and I multiply it by CE, that's going to be the same as AE times BE. So I, I know that DE is 3. I don't know what CE is. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I know that AE is 6 and BE is 4. And so I'll get 3 times CE is equal to 24. Divide both sides by 3. And CE must be 8. And again, right, clearly the two chords aren't the same length. One of them's 11 units long, one of them's 10 units long. But 8 times 3 and 6 times 4, that product is consistent, that product is constant. Now, why does this happen? And it's remarkable, right? Like, it doesn't matter how big or small they are. I could have a something like this, and I could take a really kind of tiny chord with a longer chord, okay? And the plain fact is if I took that small length here and I multiplied it by that large length, I'd get the same answers if I took that times that. So let's figure out why that's true in the last problem. Okay, proving the theorem. We can prove our theorem about partition lengths of chords by the use of similar triangles. Bring me back to unit seven, right? Similarity is gonna become important in this particular unit, all right? So let's take a look at exercise number four. In circle O shown, segment AB and CD intersect at E. We wish to prove that AE times BE is equal to CE times DE. All right, cool. Letter A. Draw in auxiliary line segments AC and BD. All right, so this is yet again a situation where we have to draw on auxiliary segments in order to prove something. So go ahead and draw those in really quickly, and then we'll talk about them. All right, let me get them in there. There they are. Now, right away, what you see that happens is we end up getting two triangles, triangle AEC, and triangle DEB. Let's take a look at letter B. Give an argument for why triangle AEC must be similar to triangle DEB. So I, I claim that this triangle and this triangle aren't just two random triangles showing up in, a, in circles or in a circle. They are actually similar triangles. Pause the video now and see if you can come up with an argument for why they must be similar. Well, it's kind of cool. We can actually use something that we learned about inscribed angles. Now notice, right? Angle A and angle D both intercept arc BC, right? They both intercept arc BC, and two inscribed angles that intercept the same arc must be congruent. So angle D must be congruent to angle B because they intercept the same arc. All right, those have to be congruent. Did I mess that one up? D, not B. Yeah, I don't know why. Angle D and angle A, right? Angle A and angle D. Angle D and angle A. I don't know where B came from. Thank you, Joey. All right, so angle D and angle A are congruent because they intercept the same arc, specifically arc BC. Now, we could bring in this pair of vertical angles right here but I like this whole intercept the same arc line of reasoning. And the same is true for angle B and angle C. So angle B is congruent to angle C for the same reason, right? They also intercept the same arc. That arc just happens to be arc AD this time, All right? So we can now say, therefore, Triangle AEC is similar to triangle DEB by the angle-angle theorem. All right, those two triangles are similar, okay? And it's just, it's so elegant the way that works out, right? And again, it works out based on the fact that, right, two inscribed angles that intercept the same arc must have the same measure and therefore must be congruent. But now we've got these two, two similar triangles, right? Let me again mark this up 
and this up. Okay. And letter C says, based on triangle AEC being congruent to triangle DEB, prove that AE times BE is equal to CE times DE. Well, this is really just the last two lines in the type of similarity proofs that we did back in, I believe it was unit seven, all right? When we proved two triangles were similar, typically by the angle-angle theorem of similarity, right? We can now say that side AE divided by side DE, right? They're both across from these double arc marks here. So AE divided by DE, that, must be the same, right, as CE divided by BE. Now, it would be very understandable if you said, well, wh why not AC divided by BD, right? Why not bring these two segments in? And we could, except a couple things. One, those were the auxiliary line segments that we drew in right at the beginning. They're really not part of this problem. They just help us to see the two similar triangles. That's all, right? Now, the reason would, would, for this is that because, right, corresponding sides in similar triangles are proportional. Right? They're proportional. Right? This one divided by this one equals this one divided by this one. Now remember, this is what we're looking to get, which is just basically taking this proportion and turning it into a product, right? This whole like, oh, let's just kind of cross multiply, right? AE times BE now must be equal to CE times DE. And the technical reason for that is that the product of the means equals the product of the extremes. And that's it, right? And again, it's amazing because in every circle, when you draw in two chords and they intersect each other, if they intersect each other, because there's no reason two chords have to, but if two chords intersect each other, then these similar triangles, even though they don't necessarily like show up, they exist. You know, I got these two, two intersecting chords, right? And even though they don't, aren't drawn in, as soon as I draw those two in, then what happens is I've got two similar triangles. Due to those two similar triangles, this particular proportion is true, and because this particular proportion is true, this particular product is true, all right? Now, it's a very easy result. Literally, the previous problem is the only problem that we're actually gonna do on that, because really, how many of those do you have to do? You know, you like, you've got three of the four partition segment lengths, and you're looking for the fourth one. That's basically it, right? So, we had two major results today that applied to intersecting chords. One of the results was the angles that those two intersecting chords make. And that angle, or angles, right, is always going to be equal to one half of the sum of the two arcs that they intercept, or the two arcs that they intercept summed divided by two. All right, and that particular one, right, we saw came from the exterior angle theorem combined with the inscribed angle theorem, the whole one half the measure of the intercepted arc. The other theorem that we saw was about the lengths of the intersecting chords, specifically the partitioned lengths, and the idea that the products of the partitioned lengths were constant, right? So AE times BE is equal to CE times DE. And that, interestingly enough, came from the similarity of two triangles. All right, so you definitely wanna commit those two theorems to memory. Unfortunately, the one thing I, I don't like particularly about this unit, I love the results of this unit, 
but you have to end up committing them to memory. And they're not on that beautiful little formula sheet that you're given at the end of the year, which is weird because they give you all sorts of other formulas, but they don't particularly give you these, so you have to memorize them. So spend some time tonight working on the homework, memorizing these theorems. We're gonna be using them in larger problems as we move on. For now, I just wanna thank you for joining me for another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.